Okie dokie. Oh. A podcast for those addicted to the study of scripture. Welcome fellow addicts, this is your safe place to OD. Here I am. What are we going to talk about today? Today we are still smack dab in the middle of the Gospels. This is Gospels part 73, and the tension is continuing to build, it seems like, with Jesus and these final six months of his life. We had, we were pretty much exclusively in the chapter of John last week, and we see within the Feast of Tabernacles about, uh, in the midst of that, people are seeking to try to arrest him um and there's people crowds within the jewish leadership that are struggling like well we thought that the messiah was going to come from a mysterious origin and they're they're not okay with the locality of jesus being of places that they know claiming to be messiah and then you have this other group who is so upset that he is from Galilee, and how they they think that right. nothing good could come from Galilee. And we had this grandiose moment on the last day of the festival where they're pouring out the, the drink offering uh, as a way to plead to God for provision, um, both physically and spiritually for the upcoming year. And right when the priest is getting ready to pour the water out, Jesus yells out among the silence oh i forgot to add last week that uh within that festival they let the kids make these ornamental things that are a part of the festival that mimic the sound of rainfall Uh, i can't remember certain types of plants or fruit seeds and they would fashion together and shake them really hard during that part of the festival to continue to build the suspense so you can get that picture kids are making it rain and then jesus says if anyone is thirsty (laughs) if anyone wants true water you should come to me and oh man that was just such a big moment and controversial moment within their culture yeah that was crazy stuff and you know i mean we're sort of building it up we're telling our narrative we're painting our picture you know, there's no rule that says we're absolutely right about everything, but it's pretty compelling that this is kind of what's going on. So it's a, it's a great, great image. And the the thing, you know, we kind of ended up with the crowd that they were they were divided. I think is what it said. Some people thought, "Oh, this is really the." I mean, this is like Messiah, and others were going, "Nah, can't be so." Whatever. And it actually, when we ended last week, it it really felt like, well, there you have it. We've reached the end of a story, (laughs) except that right here where we pick up, it's not the end. They're going to keep going. So uh, let's start there. We're in chapter chapter 7 of John, verses 44 through 52, says this. Some of them wanted to arrest him, but no one laid hands on him. The officers then came to the chief priests and Pharisees, who said to them, Why did you not bring him? And the officers answered, No one ever spoke like this man. And the Pharisees answered them, Have you also been deceived? Have any of the authorities or the Pharisees believed in him? But this crowd that does not know the law is accursed. Nicodemus, who had gone to him before, and who was one of them, said to them, Does our law judge a man without first giving him a hearing and learning what he does? They replied, Are you from Galilee too? Search and see that no prophet arises from Galilee. So we got some snippy old dudes in here, if you know what I'm saying. They're just, yeah, they're not happy about some stuff. So we already know that the people were divided. Some people thought he was Messiah. Some people thought not, whatever. John tells us that, you know, as we continue the story, so there are some there that want to arrest him, but they don't. And I'm sure we all remember back, it wasn't that long ago, when the chief priests and the Pharisees had sent officers to arrest him. It was back in verse 32. 
And I don't know, in, in the, the actual text of John, it kind of felt like the story had moved on from them, but apparently not. They're there, but they do nothing. They have done nothing. They still do nothing. Uh, instead, they're going to go back to the chief priests and Pharisees that sent them empty-handed, which, you know, it's probably safer than going back to some of the Romans empty-handed, but whatever, it's probably not a good idea. They're obviously bothered. The, the scribes, Pharisees, the leaders, whoever, they're bothered that these officers have not done as they were told. And what is the officer's excuse or explanation? It's just, I, I don't even know if you would think this was a good excuse or not, but they just say, no one has ever spoke like this man, which leads you to believe that they were kind of kind of hearing what he was saying, kind of buying into it, like he was making some sense. And so probably like many others, they're 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 convinced this guy really might be the Messiah. At least they were they were convinced enough to not arrest him, right? It, it was bothering them. We we can we can't do that to this guy, right? But <laughs> the Pharisees <laughs> they're kind of snarky, and and what they say back is, "Oh, great! Now you're deceived too," and and then. They, they try to strengthen their position by saying, have you seen any of us, you know, the important, actual, learned people, the ones who ought to know, do you see any of us believing in him? This crowd that doesn't even know the law, which we would have to say they don't know the law near as much as the Pharisees, supposedly, they don't even know the law. Well, that crowd, they're just detestable abominable. When you hear that word accursed, a lot of people just go with the part that says cursed, <laughs> but that's not the right thing. It's accursed, and, and the underlying word is more like detestable or abominable. And and so Pharisees are, so you've joined in with them? Fools. <laughs> so that's kind of that's the, the interplay that's going on. And then, I don't know, I think something very interesting happens. Nicodemus is there. Samuel, do you remember the last time we talked about Nicodemus? Now, is he the guy that came to Jesus like in the middle of the night to to ask yeah. him questions about his identity and his purpose and the words that he was saying? Yeah, and he is a Pharisee. He was a teacher of teachers, it told us. He's, a, he's an important guy, and he's a part of this group. If you want to go back and review any of that, that's back, boy, this is way back. This is in the episodes uh, titled The Gospels, number eight and number nine. That would actually be The Gospels, number 16 and 17. Thank you very much. Way back in John chapter three. So Nicodemus is there. He, we know, has been affected by Jesus's words. And for all we know, maybe he's still being affected. And remember, Nicodemus claimed when he was talking to Jesus back in John chapter 3, that there were others like him among the Pharisees. So Nicodemus isn't the only guy that's kind of on Jesus' side, at least curious or open. Now, maybe he doesn't use the boldest words you've ever heard, but he does offer some defense. Uh, What did he say back in the thing? It was, does our law judge a man without first giving him a hearing and learning what he does? Which, uh, let's talk about that for a second, because that may actually be a little more powerful than it, than it appears. You can hear, uh, he, okay, in, in, in the actual words, it's not like he's defending Jesus individually or personally, however you want to say that. He's just kind of defending, you know, any man generally. But he's asking if the Torah would approve of how these guys are going after Jesus. And he's, I think, alluding to some pretty clear stuff. So, Samuel, how about you read from Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 6? On the evidence of two witnesses or of three witnesses, the one who is to die shall be put to death. A person shall not be put to death on the evidence of one witness. So you kind of get the idea that uh, this is what Nicodemus is alluding to, and little side note, we'll get into this more later. 
the nit, the witnesses have to be reliable, good, good witnesses. And so Nicodemus is pushing back. Hey, are you sure that this is right? And if you were to read more, it's a little long, we won't go into it, but you could also read a little more in Deuteronomy chapter 19, verses 15 to 20. If you've got a Bible available, I recommend, take a look at it, it's even better. It starts with a similar statement, and then it continues with how to properly deal with a malicious witness that's accusing falsely. So this is also very interesting in our context here. But Samuel, I've pulled out just a little bit from that section. Why don't you read that? If a malicious witness arises to accuse a person of wrongdoing, then both parties to the dispute shall appear before the Lord, before the priests and the judges who are in office in those days. The judges shall inquire diligently And if the witness is a false witness and has accused his brother falsely, then you shall do to him as he had meant to do to his brother. So you shall purge the evil from your midst. Whoa. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) That's really good, isn't it? If you falsely accuse someone, Whatever it is you were trying to, you know, sort of get them in trouble for or whatever their punishment might have been or whatever, if you turn out to be a false witness, you get the punishment that they would have gotten. That's the old Jewish measure for measure. Yeah, we need that. I'm just putting in my vote right here, right now. But now hearing that, going back to what Nicodemus said, these other guys, the fact that People like us can go back and find good references in the Old Testament that kind of match up with our context. You know that they were good at it, too. And so they probably understood what Nicodemus was getting at or what he was referring to. And it's it's possible that Nicodemus's words, they were actually far more bold than we might guess just reading it here. It doesn't seem like he's really going after him, but... There's a lot of important stuff behind it. So it's, I don't know, it's good. Nicodemus is sticking up for Jesus right in there in the, in the middle of the whole group. It's kind of cool. So anyway, these, uh, the other scribes and Pharisees, the ones that, that do want to get Jesus arrested, potentially killed, they're now, they've already shown disdain for like the officers that didn't make the arrest. They've shown disdain for the crowds who are believing this guy. And now, Yeah, because they're generous. They're going to freely shower this disdain on Nicodemus as well, because that's what they do. And what do they say? Are you from Galilee too? And I'm sure we've mentioned this more than once. Galilee, you know, was kind of considered like that wasn't the greatest place to be from, especially if you were from in and around Jerusalem. So... Now, what we could do, are you from Galilee too? We could, uh, there's a possible better translation. If we really look carefully at the underlying Greek, it might be better to say something like, are you a cotton-headed ninny muggins too? (laughs) Now, it's up for debate. Obviously. It is, uh, you know, but yeah, but that's in there. And then they say something that actually, and we know because we're on the outside looking back and all that. They say something that's actually very ignorant. They say, search and see that no prophet arises from Galilee. And it's wrong on a couple different fronts. First, Jonah was actually from the same geographic area that at this time is known as the Galilee. That's kind of crazy. So a prophet did already arise from Galilee. And then to be fair, There are some texts that actually say, see, search and see that the prophet does not arise from Galilee. Now, if that turned out to be the actual correct version of the text, well, then they're just, they're just right. I mean, because it's supposed to be from Bethlehem. But if the words that we have see that no prophet arises, well, they've already blown it with Jonah. Uh, Secondly, we know that Jesus was born in Bethlehem, and that actually does fit the scriptures and the predictions and all that. But apparently, they don't know that. 
I, I, I don't know if I do or should feel sorry for these guys or anything like that, but they're operating on bad info. At the very least, this should be a great life lesson for us, no matter how confident we may be about anything that we think or believe or see or know, etc. You know, you just got to leave room for new or more or better information. I mean, you know, the kind of stuff we're dealing with, it could be the difference between life and death for you or someone else. That could be figurative. That could be literal. But we, as Jesus has commanded them a little earlier in the podcast, we must aim for more righteous judgment every day. Yeah, that's so good. It is something to wrestle with, though, with the Pharisees' response here about no prophet arising from Galilee, because on the whole, I treat that sect of Judaism as knowing their text extremely oh, yeah. well, like more more well than probably our current 21st century Western minds are even able to comprehend how well they knew their text. So I feel like right. that there has to be something... I'm, I'm, I need to give room that they could, you know, this could have been a slip up for them, but there could also be something at play here, like emotionally or like culturally in terms of what their people group have experienced through the, these particular Pharisees parents and their parents coming out of exile and like what they're hoping for with the prophet or prophets in general. So that's just, it's, it it comes across still very complicated to me that they would say a statement yeah. like that with how well they knew the story. Yeah, I think we could come up with a number of explanations that would actually be, you know, sort of like for their benefit or on their side, giving them the benefit of the doubt kind of stuff. It could even be as simple as they're just being snotty-nosed brats. Mm -hmm. and, and they're just like, yeah, no profit comes from Galilee, you know, just, just being a butt about it, so... I don't know. Who knows? So we move on because that's what we do. And now, okay, so we're entering into a section of text. We're going to continue in uh, John chapter seven. There's only one more verse left and into John chapter eight. But there's a big section here that it either isn't even in your Bible or if it is in your Bible, it's probably even got some sort of special markings around it because almost no one lets this section stand without some sort of indication that this isn't in the most reliable manuscripts. But I think there's value. So we're going to look at it. Just to be clear, make sure that we, we're located properly. We're at the end of the Festival of Sukkot. We've talked a lot about that festival, and we've talked about that there's an additional celebration that's added right onto the end called the eighth day, the Shemini Etzeret. And you could read about that if you wanted to. It's back in Leviticus chapter 23, uh, specifically verse 36, but whatever, read around there. And it represents not only the conclusion of Sukkot, but the conclusion of the annual festival cycle. And now... To, to get this idea in your head, we know that there is no eighth day in an ordinary week. But if ordinary time ended, like this age ended, if something was going to follow that, whatever day that would follow, well, you might think of that as an eighth day. It's like a new beginning, starting over, something. So, I say that, again, to bring up the point that this day has come to represent what follows this age, this world. And you'll see it in your Bible, probably most often referred to as the world to come. The stories that follow here in John, I don't know. I find them very difficult to place in time. Sometimes it feels like the writer's making them a part of Sukkot or the eighth day or whatever, and then other times... Not so much, and it's really hard to tell. John is usually so good, you know, with his writing abilities, but I, maybe it's just me. He just loses me on this one, and I can't find anybody, any, you know, particular studies that were able to anchor me in. So we're going to focus on trying to understand what it is John is saying, as opposed to trying to, 
you know, work too much on trying to get us firmly placed in location or time or whatever. But uh, we've given you info. You could try to dive deeper yourself, whatever. And the things that we think we do know, we'll try and tell you. But I don't know. Just know we're trying to figure out what John's trying to say. As I as I mentioned, people don't really give this section of scripture a lot of credence. Uh, in fact, the idea is they think that it was inserted later. Now, that could be a bad thing, like somebody just made it up, right? That would be bad. But it could also be that somewhere along the way, there was something that was lost and somebody had just a small snippet from this thing that was lost. And so rather than lose it entirely, they just stuck it in here. And the most popular suggestion is that there there was a writing referred to as the Gospel of the Hebrews. We know about it, but we've lost it. And some think that this little section came from that. How would we know? We don't. But there's, a, you know, again, I think there's much to be gained from the text. We're going to try and do that. And John starts it out by telling us, you know what, Sam, did I even read it? I was I was wondering if you were doing all this context stuff to get ready to read the verses. <laughs> you know what, now would be a good time. Yeah. Let's read that. <laughs> so it's John chapter 7, verses 53, and I'm just going to read through chapter 8, verse 2. It says this. They went each to his own house, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning, he came again to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. So, it starts out by John telling us that everyone went home. They, they went each to his own house. Well, Okay, who's they? Who is everyone? It can't really be everyone, whatever. But Jesus heads off to the Mount of Olives. Now, I don't, I don't even remember if we talked about this before. It was a very popular place for especially people like from the Galilee or whatever, outsiders to go pitch their sukkah, their little uh, temporary tent, whatever. So maybe that's why he went there. We don't know. But Jesus is sticking around Jerusalem. And in fact, <laughs> still strange, He's going to continue to go to the temple and teach. Now, John says all the people came to him. Okay, but he also just said that everybody was going back home. So let's just say this. You know what? Large numbers of those who remained in Jerusalem, okay, they came out to him. Mm -hmm. Let's just leave it at that. Because, again, John's being a little confusing if this even came from John. That's a real question. But then, so you got this little intro, and then some drama happens. So we get down to chapter 8, verses 3 through 6. Let's read that. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery. And placing her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. So what do you say? And this they said to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him. And Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. They had me and then they lost me. <laughs> Jesus got all so, mysterious. Yeah, yeah, it's weird. So scribes and Pharisees bring a woman, you know, to Jesus in front of, I'm assuming it's front of some sort of crowd, maybe, but whatever, it's it's to Jesus. They put her there in the midst. She's been caught in the act of adultery. Now, give you a moment to set your mental image on that. Caught in the act, okay? But there's a question in this, and I know it may sound really weird to us, but the question is, was she a married woman? Or was she only betrothed? That's important because if it's adultery, you must be one of those two. I mean, there's, uh, you know, other words for other types of sexual immorality, but for adultery, it has to be one of those two. And the reason I'm pointing this out is because if we read about Jewish tradition around this time period, they actually treated the two differently. 
if you were betrothed, you were to be stoned. But if you were married, and I don't even know what they mean by this word, you were to be strangled. <laughs> what? <laughs> okay. It sounds really bad. So that tradition would suggest that she was betrothed. And if that's true, she could have been very young. And like, you know, for us to get the idea, we need to start thinking teenager-ish, possibly even young teenager-ish. And then think about this. I, I Just, you know, you may have already thought it or maybe we're pointing it out. If she was caught in the act, does logic not tell us that there would have had to have been a guy caught in the act too? It takes two to tango. Yeah. Where's he? I, I What's going on? So already you see there's something off with these accusers. And I'm even going to say it this way because it's going to matter. The credibility of these accusers is already taking a hit, is it not? And, okay, little side note. Remember how we talked about Sukkot? We talked about how, you know, there's kind of a party atmosphere. And, you know, they did some things to try to keep it safer, whatever. Is there any part of you that thinks, you know, we're at the end of Sukkot. They found this girl in adultery. Is this kind of highlighting the potential danger of mm. the seven days Sukkot party, right? <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. Who knows? Maybe it has nothing to do with that. But, I mean, you know, it's a, it's a question. We should ask. So anyway, they tell Jesus she has been caught in the act and that the Torah commands her to be stoned to death. And then they ask what he has to say about it. And just to point this out, we don't have to wonder if these guys are sincere. We know that they're not because John tells us that they were testing him because they hoped to bring some charge against him. And here's how I think the trap was supposed to work. If he said to Stoner, well, then he'd be in trouble with the Romans because the Jews were not supposed to carry out a death sentence. That that right to carry out that portion of the law had been stripped from them. They had to work through Rome. So if he said Stoner, they'd be he'd be in trouble with the Romans. But if he said to let her go then they could tell everybody that he was speaking against the Torah, encouraging lawlessness. So it seems like kind of a good trap, right, Samuel? Kind of. But Jesus, is he wily? Oh, wiliest of the wilies. <laughs> That's right. He, he does something strange. In response to their question, and remember, their question was, what do you say? He just bent down and started writing in the dust on the ground. That's weird. I don't care who you are. And then, of course, Samuel, you tell me, do you think across the centuries people have speculated much about what he was writing in the dirt? I mean, still to this day, it, <laughs> it eats me alive. Oh, yeah. And it's been it's been nonstop. People have had so many ideas. So... We're never going to know. We're, I mean, we weren't there. We can't say what it was, but I'm going to lay some theories on you. And, you know, like I always do, I'll save my favorite for last, whatever. But here, the, here we go. We'll go from sort of like the easiest or silliest, whatever, to uh, the best. One actual popular theory is that Jesus, you know, he was just drawing or doodling or scribbling, whatever you want to call it, because, you know, he was thinking of what he was going to say. <laughs> Now, can, can we dispute that? No. I mean, it sounds a little silly, but I mean, it, it, I mean it's possible. I mean, there is some truth to that, too, with like waiting to, before you speak rather than exactly. going out rashly. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. So there's one. That's a, 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 that's, that's a real one. A lot of like smart, smart people think that's the answer. Now, there's another one. They, they suggest that Jesus was, I don't know, in some way, he was, I don't know if we should say imitating or, or trying to allude back to uh, something that went on in the old, uh, uh, well, I shouldn't say the old, in the tabernacle. It was called the bitter water ceremony for adultery. 
And in part of this ceremony, a little bit of the dust from the floor of the tabernacle or the temple is added to water and uh, other things go on. But anyway, this, this woman accused of adultery is supposed to drink the water. And then basically one of two things are going to happen. She's either going to hit the ground and her uh, intestines are going to pop out or she's going to be fine. And you go read about it. It's in Numbers chapter 5, verses 11 to 31, whatever. It's it's kind of weird. But, you know, the suggestion is, well, you know, Jesus, he he's messing with dust on the ground. And, and this is about adultery. So there's your connection. It must have something to do with that. Well, okay. I mean, I see the connection. I don't know what that's really telling us. But, uh, okay, whatever. I can't dispute it. But uh, I don't know. It doesn't really sell me. And then this one is similar. It's 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 um, in Roman custom at this time when everybody was going before some sort of judge, whatever. There's going to be a verdict. I, I don't exactly know how this all worked, but the the custom was when they were about to announce or pronounce the verdict, they first had to write it. So you write the verdict out. And only when you're finished do you announce it. And that was a Roman custom. And so some people think, well, yeah, Jesus was actually alluding to that. Now, again, I don't know why that would be relevant or why he would be doing that or whatever. I I, I, I guess I see the connection, why people might think it. But again, it isn't really selling me. And so here's one more. And, I, you know, you may or may not like it, but I'm going to share it anyway. At least this one seems to have some grounding in scripture that kind of feels, you know, appropriate, whatever. So it goes like this. What they're suggesting is that Jesus was acting out something that we see back in Jeremiah chapter 17. And why don't you just read part of it for us, uh, Samuel? Just read chapter, uh, verse 13. O Lord, the hope of Israel, all who forsake you shall be put to shame. Those who turn away from you shall be written in the earth, for they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living water. Okay. For those who turn away from you shall be written in the earth. You can probably hear the connection. He was writing, or the, the, the speculation goes this way, that he was writing the names of the accusers, when he was down writing in the dust to the ground, writing the accusers' names. Now, that would mean that in this case, they would be those who had turned away from God. So, you know, we're, we're seeing that they're kind of being, they're kind of being a little weird about this and, and they're trying to trap God's Messiah and whatever. So, okay, they could definitely be ones who have turned away, forsaken God. And then, I don't know if you caught this, Samuel, right at the end, it says that for they have taken the Lord and then what? The fountain of living water. Yeah. And we were just in Sukkot. You said it in your intro. He did the big thing at the ceremony. I am the living. Right? Mm-hmm. This is so great. So they've got that reference in there. This one, again, is it right? I don't know. But at least this one feels pretty cool. It feels like it's actually touching some real relevant points and it, it fits. So... You never know. These guys may be right. But for whatever reason, Jesus is writing with his finger on the ground. And whether we know what it is or not, we're just going to keep going with the story. Let's see what he says. All right. I think Samuel is just excited to find out what happens. He's like, yeah, no. <laughs> I'm not going to say anything because I want to hear the end of the story. Here we go. John chapter 8, verses 7 through 9. And as they continued to ask him, he stood up. And said to them, let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more, he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Okay, what's going on here? So the accusers, obviously, they really wanted him to answer, right? I mean, we've got to trap him. So they kept pushing, 
What are you going to say? What are you going to say? So finally, Jesus stands up and he says, hey, whichever one of you guys is without sin, go ahead, throw the first stone. So if you go back to the original question, it kind of sounds like he's choosing the Torah answer. And as we said before, if that were the case, that would probably get him in trouble with the Romans. Except, Samuel, did we mention that Jesus was wily? Definitely. Yeah. He does it in a very wise way. He actually uses the Torah against them. Let me show you what I mean. So, for someone to be convicted and a sentence to be carried out, there had to be two or three witnesses. And, as I mentioned before, super important, they had to be reliable witnesses. Anybody with like some sort of character issue or something, okay, they're not, shouldn't be acceptable witnesses. And so what Jesus does is he puts the ball right back in their court. If you think you are without sin, then start slinging those stones. And so what Jesus has done is he's made the question posed to him, for all practical purposes, irrelevant. Because what he's moved to, instead of the question about adultery or whatever, it's now moved to a question of the reliability of the witnesses. And so by doing that, it doesn't even matter what Jesus thought if no court ever would have convicted her anyway, right? Jesus doesn't have any legal standing to make a decision, but what Jesus is doing is showing, hey, your witnesses wouldn't even stand up in a real court. Forget about just standing here talking to me because these witnesses are proving to be a little bit sketchy. And I feel like we've talked about this before. The Jewish courts were notoriously merciful. They avoided the death sentence every way that they could. And this wasn't a bad thing. I mean, they weren't doing it out of disobedience. What they were actually doing was trying to either imitate or mimic or or somehow uh, pass along God's mercy. They knew God to be merciful, and they wanted to judge in a similar way. So I think this is one of those areas where, at least generally, you kind of got to give the Jews and their courts and whatever, uh, you got to give them kudos. This, This is laudable. It's good. Now, this is also important. So you're listening to this story, you're hearing what's going on, but it's important to notice that Jesus was not in any way trying to replace the mean old law with some sort of new, loving, and merciful law of his own. That's not what happened here at all. Jesus was leveraging Torah, all of Torah to arrive at what he considered to be the most righteous judgment. It is is a just outcome. It is a merciful outcome. Now, we may wonder, how could that be so? And, And we might even wonder, did he know things that we don't know or weren't told, whatever? Don't know. But somehow, Jesus thought that this was the best answer. And and I think... Just in normal, everyday Jewish life in the first century, this woman wouldn't have had to face a penalty anyway, because these uh, witnesses, they they weren't going to hold up. Now, just to say it out loud, this is all a far greater example of Jesus upholding Torah than it is one of Jesus going against Torah. It's very similar the way the courts operated anyway, and it's even reasonable to think, I don't know, Jesus might have considered the accuser's behavior and their motives to actually be more egregious of a violation of Torah than the adulteress's behavior. Now, I I don't know, but I I mean, whatever, we've seen Jesus prioritize before. So the point is, he focused on them. And so he was you know, discounting the witnesses, except (laughs) he didn't actually do anything. He gave it, he he let them do it. They decide. So he goes back to writing in the dirt. And, you know, we said before, maybe he was writing the names of his accusers, kind of like the Jeremiah 17, 13 thing. And I mean, come on, that would have been pretty freaky. You know, did he know all of them on a first name basis or whatever? (laughs) But he was writing their names out. That'd be kind of weird. 
But I've even heard some suggest that he wasn't only writing their names, he was also writing their sin alongside the name. Now, again, do we know? No, we have no idea. But could you imagine? (laughs) That would be even more crazy. But whatever he was writing, it seems to have been pretty pretty uh, compelling. He, he didn't speak a lot of words. He was writing these things, but somehow it was enough to foil their trap. They begin to go away one by one, and then John tells us, starting with the oldest. Samuel, what do we say comes with age? Wisdom. Yes, with age comes wisdom. So they start to go away one by one, starting with the oldest. And, you know, so maybe it's because they were also the wisest. They understood what Jesus has done. They understood that their trap had failed. They understood that they were actually starting to now look like the bad guy. It was time to slink away. In any case, we get to the end of this part. And now, again, we don't really know about a crowd or whatever, but John's wording says, it's just Jesus and this woman left. She's standing before him, and then, you know, lucky we got time. Otherwise, this would be a terrible cliffhanger. (laughs) Well, hopefully we got time after the stuff that I want to talk about. (laughs) Well, bring it on! Oh, man. Uh, (laughs) While this last point that you were bringing up, I just had this vivid picture coming in my mind. What if Jesus, like, when when they first came to him with this woman situation— and he starts riding in the dirt, in the dirt, and we're let's just pretend that we're using the Jeremiah seventeen interpretation of what that means. And he's riding. I mean, especially if we're thinking about it being a large crowd, he's and him being, you know, the divine aspect of him of himself. Like he knows the names of these people, and so in some way he's like one by one, kind of looking around at the crowd, going back riding someone's name down in Hebrew or Aramaic and then at some point that gets interrupted and he stands up and says that like let the first one of you who is without sin cast the first stone and then he goes back to continue to write the names what if as those people are contemplating and they begin you know to scatter one by one Jesus wipes that person's name out of the dirt like, you know, oh. he, he's got a long list of people's names to write because there's a lot of people there. You know, he's writing a name. He sees someone goes, he leaves, he scribbles that name out and then continues. I don't know. I just, oh, yeah. yeah, it just came in my mind and kind of showcases like repentance and, you know, forgiveness in some way and them having the opportunity to turn away from where they were currently standing and to try to practice something different. Yeah, and we don't really get the sense that they repented as in they, "Eh, you know what, let's just be on Jesus' side from now on. (laughs) But yeah, I totally get the picture you're painting. Mm -hmm. It's uh, That's, again, it's the beauty of all the scripture, but especially John's, he, he leaves a lot of room for you to think through stuff. Now, that can't be all. You made it sound like you had some questions. Yeah, um, I, I wanted to point out that What Jesus did was pretty risky in the sense that, like, he left the response in the hands of, I I mean, the crowds, the Pharisees, whoever it is that is asking him what to do. And I, I think that we should give space to recognize the skill that these people had at being able to reflect at their own lives. Because, yeah. I mean, we, we've talked about it earlier in our walk through the Gospels, this, this idea of what in Jewish world being a hypocrite means, like being an actor, like you you are doing all the righteous things, but it's all just for show. And some of these people, whether they were being driven by vengeance or self-gratification or making themselves feel righteous and pompous, like... Jesus opening that door for them could have just given them, like, you know, falsely these people could have thought, yeah, I know where I stand, like, I'm following the law, like, watch out, woman, like, here comes the first stone, but it's powerful that, yeah. that, that, that like, at the, at, at the end of this passage, with it just being Jesus and the woman left, showcases that all of these people 
took to heart what Jesus said, they all reflected enough to be able to walk away from that. I just think that's very powerful. And I yeah. I also think that whenever someone has the opportunity to potentially take the life of someone else, actually it 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 falls into their hands. It it becomes much more real and I don't know. I mean, you said it earlier, the text said it, they were using it as a trap. They may have not even originally wanted to stone this woman. They were maybe fueled by more just wanting to get Jesus in a place where they could arrest them more than actually wanting to convict this woman. And then when Jesus is like, okay, like, here you go. Like, here's your chance. They're like, oh, like, we didn't want, we didn't actually want to do this. Like, <laughs> we just wanted to get you into trouble. Now you're saying that we have the opportunity to kill someone? Like, no, we're not about that. Yeah. Hey, you know what? That is a really good point. That's another way in which, when I was trying to talk about how, hey, this is the, the more just and merciful outcome or whatever, they were just using her as a pawn, in a sense, trying to get at him. And so that's another piece of that puzzle. Yeah, good image, Sammy. Yeah, good, good. I like it. What else? I'm going to shut up now so that we can try to get to the end of the story before a cliffhanger. <laughs> oh, man, we can do it. We can do it. All right, so here's the last bit. And this this also is the last bit of that. Remember I said there's a big section that people don't believe should be in your Bible or it's been inserted from somewhere else or whatever. This is the last part of that, just so you know. John chapter 8, verses 10 and 11. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? And she said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. Ooh, that was short, but there's a lot of good right in here. (laughs) So, so Jesus speaks to the woman, and, and you know, the question is, where have your accusers gone? He asks, I mean, is there any one of them left to condemn her? Now, maybe we should stop for a moment. Try to put yourself back in her shoes. Can you even imagine what's going through her brain right at this point? Number one, everything in this story suggest that she was actually guilty. And so, let's just say, she knows she's guilty. She even heard Jesus tell the others to stone her. But, you know, at least, sort of. And still, they're gone, she's here, and and she's able to see, you know, the truth of the situation, or how it's worked out. And and so she answers his question, who's left it? There's no one left. Not one of them has condemned me. And I mean, her mind had to be reeling, just reeling. What does that even mean? I was, I was facing death. You know, what the heck is going on? And again, we have no indication that she is innocent. We're, we, we, I think we have to assume that she is guilty. It's, it's only, seems only reasonable with the text. And Jesus says something amazing. I don't condemn you either. And now, again, this this girl, put yourself in her shoes. Go back. What the heck is going through her brain at this point? Now, we could, we could say that uh, Jesus, you know, uh, he's, he's not some sort of legal person. Person. He doesn't have a position of authority, no official position, right? So, so he has no right or authority to condemn her anyway. And and if if we say that, I mean, number one, it's true because he's just a common Israelite. But we also know that in this story and and in everything that we've been seeing in the Gospels, that we're we're beyond legalities. There's more. And and there's this thing about Jesus, and we know, because again, we have the beauty, the, the fortune of hindsight, we know that Jesus on his first visit wasn't here for the purpose of judging, at least not in the same way that he's going to be on his second coming at the end of the kingdom and all that kind of thing. His first visit, the, the point of it was to 
save. And he was going to do that through his righteous life, through his undeserved suffering, his undeserved death. But that's his part. And I think it would be wrong for us to forget that we also have a part. He was here to save also through repentance. That would be our repentance. Our, and what does repentance mean in Scripture, Samuel? It only means one thing. Turning back to the Torah. Yes, turning back to Torah. And if you think we're crazy and that we shouldn't say that all the time like we do, here's the proof. Not condemning her was not the end of the story. And this is so important. Jesus says he doesn't condemn her. And and that's awesome and beautiful and loving and just gives us hope and all kinds of it's great. But he also tells her that she must repent. She must go and continue with her life, but it must be free of sin. He says, sin no more. Now, Samuel. Do we think that Jesus was actually requiring perfection of her for her whole life? Seems impossible. No, he wasn't. But he was expecting a faithfulness and a loyalty that would leave no doubt that she was on team God or on team Jesus or whatever. And the thing is, that's no different for any of us. Being you call it whatever you want, being saved or born again or whatever, it must be accompanied by the putting away of sin. And again, sin is defined in Torah. And so we must seek to keep Torah as it applies to us to the best of our ability. Now, what does that mean? That means we must study Torah, dig deep into it, find out what it's actually trying to tell us. It's not look at the list of rules and keep the rules. It's understand that they're instructions from a loving and merciful God and that they point us toward true justice and mercy and charity and love and all of that. Dig in there, find out what it says and do that because that is exactly what being a Christian is. And so, in a lot of ways, we are just like this woman caught in adultery. Mm. And if if we place our trust in him, he condemns us no more. And yet, he says to us, go and sin no more. That's so powerful. And can you believe that this is a section of text that people were not wanting to put into the canon? Like, that it's up for debate and it's controversial like i mean it that fits well with the story because it's a very controversial context with the story of the woman but right. man like can you imagine if this wasn't in the text for us to be able to glean from and learn and see the heart of jesus in this matter like man we would be missing out yeah this i, I really like this little bit i think it uh it's so rich with instruction and uh yeah i agree with you samuel i think we would be poorer without Mm -hmm. um i do have a couple of things i want to kind of ask um with this before we move on the first is should we be thinking of jesus's first statement where he says um those of you without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her with the end of the story where he declares like neither do I condemn you like I know that we talked about how legally you had to have two or three reliable witnesses so like part of this I don't know if you want to call it a theory or hypothesizing falls through but in some ways, Jesus really, truly, legally was the only person in this situation who was without sin that could justify th- like casting a stone at her, like based ba- right. based on his premise. Like, I'm not trying to say that he was like, you know, 
upset or mad at her and hold it. he was holding a stone in his hand and he was just having to relent by saying I condemn you no more but just like from a legal perspective like he had every right to based on his obedience to the law and you know the God part of himself and he he acknowledges understands identifies her wrong and yet he still like chooses to to offer her like an olive branch of new life, new beginning, another chance. Like, I don't know. Like, is it wrong for us to think about that aspect of his obedience within his original statement to the Pharisees? Oh no, I think that's awesome. And, and it, it further highlights just this idea that somehow Jesus determined that the just thing to do was to let her go and and how why what it what is that but then stop for a second and go yeah but in terms of justice do we deserve what god has done for us and 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 all of the things that he is offering us in terms of forgiveness and justification and all of those things it, it, Number one, it raises questions, questions I think we can't even answer. It's like, oh, man, what does that even mean? How does that work? Why? Whatever. And at the same time, it's it's this beautiful picture of the hope that we have, that God really is that merciful. And we really do have a reason to hope, to expect that he is actually made a way for us and and we get to experience life, and it's not because of anything we do or could do, but he did it for it. It's I don't know. It's a great picture. And that reminds so me, yeah, reminds me of uh, overwhelmingly in the Torah. Whenever the, the Hebrew words for justice is being mentioned, it's the Hebrew word mishpat, and it's not this our Western sense of retributive justice like getting giving to someone what they deserve it's it's a type of justice that is redeeming that is restorative yeah restorative to bring whatever badness or wrongness is in that situation and turn it into something good and for purposes that's going to like ultimately bring more good to the circumstance or the people involved so that's just yeah uh, and then all you also made me think like um, when you said that Jesus' conclusion was the just judgment was to pass over her, not condemn her, like like how many times, like I'm just speaking of myself, how many times do I screw up with something in my own personal life and like instinctually my my head, like, you know, very broken part of myself is like, man, like, I really suck. Like I deserve like <laughs> like yeah. the worst after what I just did and I I never even bothered to think like well wait like are you like God or are you th- is there a chance that like even though m- my human self is thinking that the just thing is for me to experience the sense of punishment or guilt or whatever that y- that y- what you desire your just judgment is to make me make a way out of this for me to to yeah to grow and to learn and to heal and everything that's just i I don't think about that enough and that just that's really good it it it, it, yeah it's just thinking that way feels restorative doesn't it Mm -hmm. yeah and here's i was thinking about this while you were talking so we're thinking in terms of our relationship with God and maybe how he might think or act toward us and the way we perceive it and what, you know, how this all looks, this is very encouraging. But remember, this also is a demonstration of how we should be acting toward others. And in the same way that God has an idea of justice and we see examples throughout scripture where he his tendency is toward restoring someone as opposed to just beating them down. Not that that doesn't happen, but you know you see it. We also, when we interact with others, you know it's 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 hard enough to forgive. 
<laughs> if anybody's being honest, right? There are just times when it's really hard. But to go even further and think that even in that, in the forgiveness, looking for how to restore the one who potentially has actually hurt you, damaged you, whatever that might be, that, oh, now see again, well, how many times have we said this? Christianity is a high, high calling. You start acting like that toward your fellow man, this has changed the world kind of stuff. Mm. It's awesome. It's exactly who I want to be. Mm. And I hope I live long enough that you all get to see it. <laughs> but it ain't going to be on this episode. <laughs> oh, Paul, that was such a perfect segue for us to end, but I actually have one more thing. That's all right. Do it. Oh, man. We'll come up with another even better ending. Okay. I, I'm I'm <laughs> trusting you. Um, this aspect that Jesus ended with, now go and sin no more. Of course, we you already brought up he wasn't demanding perfection, but this is like the – that's the calling for her going forward now. Could we potentially think about this like Jesus is referencing go and sin no more in this – area of your life that you have fallen like with adultery because like i mean true repentance is you know you you return to the torah and whatever action that you performed that goes against what god deems is good and healthy for your life you begin to ultimately you're performing the opposite of that in the direction of him and so i mean in some ways, it is possible to think about him saying, like, it is possible for you to go and sin no more with adultery. Like, go and yeah. be faithful to your spouse. Like, stay within that covenant and pursue that. And, like, in that, you won't sin, like, with this. And and he's I, I don't think that you should come across hearing that and think that Jesus is saying, like, oh, once she's done that, she's good. She's perfectly righteous. No, because you— Life is so complex, and there's so many other facets that we struggle with, or you you get stronger in one area, and then another season of life comes, and you begin struggling with something else. But I just wanted to bring that up that, I mean, he could have just been talking about life in general, but he could have also been talking about this one specific area where this whole story was built on. I think that's great. I know me, personality-wise, I I tend toward the big story, so I read this, and I see what's going on. It's like, boom! Yeah, don't sin anymore. This is how Christians are supposed to be. But no, I think your point is great. When you are in the middle of a thing, either maybe you've done something way outside of your norm and character, and that is overwhelming and just, ugh, it's, it's hard to di- live with, deal with. Or maybe you struggle in a particular area. You might even do fine in a whole bunch of other areas, but there's like one, it's just a problem for you. Whatever it is, when you're the one in this situation, it can feel overwhelming all by itself. So the, the, even to bring it back and go, well, maybe he wasn't talking so generally or universally. Maybe he just, you know, was conveying, hey, no more adultery, okay? Just stop it. Even if that's what it was, this is still huge for the person going through it, you know? Mm -hmm. And especially, I mean, (laughs) and we can't relate to this. We live in America where people act like adultery is just, well, it's just normal. In first century Israel, I mean, her life was on the line. That's what the whole story's about. Yeah. This is a really big deal. So, yeah, to, to bring it down and go, hey, you know, it doesn't even have to be general. Or, or whatever. It could have just, he could have just been talking about just adultery alone. And it still would have been as big and as impactful for a normal person's life. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. So that's, that's good. Okay. Now I'm done. All right. And so I don't know. Now everything's gotten just really awkward. <laughs> so I guess we should just, you know, kind of just say goodbye. <laughs> In some ways, I like that ending even more because of my awkward personality. Thank you, Paul. (laughs) That's all right. Seriously, let's get out of here. Okie dokie. Thank you for listening to the Okie Dokie Most podcast. Don't forget to subscribe so you never miss an episode. And be sure to leave us a rating and a review to let us know how this content is impacting your life. 
You can find out more information about the podcast at www.okidokimos.com. And if you'd like to get a hold of us, please send us an email at okidokimos at gmail.com. And until next time, we pray that you will do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. We'll talk to you again soon. Thank you.